on BBC4, a 60s battle of the books with James Nor Long hair, flowery shirts and false eyelashes this week. And that's just the boys. It's the 60s <laughs> on Battle of the Books. Hello and welcome. Yes, tonight we're back in the decade which began with the Beatles, Beehives, the Berlin Wall, the Bay of Pigs and ended with the Prague Spring, the Summer of Love and A Man on the Moon, an era which seemed to announce a new world order. Two British books then from the 60s, both written by men from the north of England, but any similarity more or less ends there. Stan Barstow's A Kind of Loving was published in 1960. It's a slice of northern working class life as it was then, the coming-of-age story of Vic Brown and his infatuation with the lovely Ingrid. Anthony Burgess's A Clockwork Orange was published only a couple of years later, but it looks forward to a pretty hellish future inhabited by its 15-year-old protagonist, Alex, and his gang of droogs. Now, both novels were made into successful films. A Kind of Loving was John Schlesinger's first film, as it happens, in 1962. A Clockwork Orange was famously filmed by Stanley Kubrick a decade later, in colour, monochrome, to Technicolor, perhaps in itself a reflection of change in that tumultuous decade which some of us remember. But the book's the thing on this programme, and our guest witnesses will shortly be called to begin that process of persuading our studio audience which of the two tomes is the better read. Let's begin by welcoming our own 60s classics, our regular advocates, the journalist and broadcaster Mariella Frostrup, <laughs> and the comedy writer and performer Kevin Day. Thank you. Now, Mariella, you're championing a kind of loving. You've got a 21st century audience here to persuade. For all I know, they're quite um, hip. How do you persuade them that uh, kitchen sink fiction from 40 years ago is still worth reading? Well, Jim, kitchen sink fiction I have a problem with to start with because all that really meant was that people started writing books about real working class people in real believable situations instead of describing them as caricatures. This is an amazing book. It's uh, totally prescient. It's a book about love and longing and every individual's battle between morality and freedom of choice, I suppose. It's also remarkably prescient. It discusses racial tension, the advent of television, the breakup of community, the demise of industry, and the boom bubble bursting. You know, look at this quote here. We're all living in a fool's paradise, a fool's paradise, Vic, of full employment and business booming. It just isn't possible, lad. Don't say I didn't warn you when the crash comes. Well, that's as true today as it was then, and everything about this book is still pertinent and relevant. Kevin, A Clockwork Orange. We all remember the film. Isn't it a film rather than a book? I think the hoo-ha about the film and about the film's violence, which most people haven't seen, has frightened many people away from the book. It's always is, accused which, of glamorising violence. <clears throat> it is, and the film does, the book doesn't. The, the, the book is a story of an ultra-violent teenager, a callous teenager, and it's about the story of the state's attempt to, to control his behaviour through drugs and, and through mind control techniques. But beyond that, it's about society and the individual, it's about age and youth, it's about the nature of choice, and it's also part written in, in NADSAT, this unique teenage slang, which, which is a, a fantastically rich slang. It's a unique book, and the, the book is so much better than the film. And it's, it is a shame that people are frightened of the book because of the image of the film. Right, it's going to be a good argument, this one, I think. Let's hear the case for the first book. It's a kind of loving. Now, Mariella, your witnesses are Deborah Phillips, writer in post-war fiction, and also lecturer in English literature at Brunel University, and the Gateshead trilogy writer, Jonathan Tulloch, whose first book, The Season Ticket, was turned into a film by the brassed-off director, Mark Herman. And uh, before we get going, Jonathan, I think you've got something of a lost property announcement. What's this? Well, it happened in the chocolate biscuit factory, actually, where I worked on the Rover tin line. <laughs> I, my job was to put the bourbons in the plastic portion. I got so skilled at it that I was able to read at the same time. A bourbon on that page, a bourbon on there, and a jammy dodger in the middle. <laughs> or was it a nice shorty? I can't remember. Yeah. Anyway, just as I was reading, I saw through the corner of my eye that the line manager was showing someone very like, famous around. So, I took my eye off it, and before I could get it, the book was down the conveyor belt and into the tin and sealed and in shrink wrap. <laughs> but there's a happy ending, because uh, just a couple of years ago, I found the same copy in a bookshop, second-hand bookshop. There was no crumbs, but I could tell it was mine. The same edition. The same one. <laughs> yeah. That's wonderful. Mariella, off you go. Um, Deborah, it's really an elegy for a community, isn't it? 
You've got a traditional working class mining town, Cressley, with a brass band and everybody knows everybody else's name and if you go to the pub you're likely to meet um, a mate and the landlord really does know your name. And um, modernity is, is, is taking over. Frankie Vaughan and Tommy Steele are more popular than the brass band. Women are working. When women are working in the factory um, and um, television is taking over. You don't go to the pictures anymore because everybody keeps saying you can get the same thing on the telly for free. It's yeah. something that, that, that Vic um, feels very strongly about, isn't it, television? I mean, there's one part in the book where he raves about Ulysses. Yes, well, you know, he's very shocked by Ulysses, but, um, well, he does offer um, his wife the choice between a symphony concert um, and the telly, and she chooses trash telly. <laughs> so you can tell this relationship is doomed. Typical woman. <laughs> but Kevin may well say that, that Clockwork Orange is a book that looks forward. I would say that A Kind of Loving is a book that looks forward. Do you agree? Uh, absolutely. I mean, I think it's written about um, the finding your way through loyalty and affection for the world that you come from while also recognizing that you have to move on and that things are moving on Cressley itself is changing as you said in your introduction you know, there is an Asian community there which is mysterious and fascinating um, um, and um, Vic also has to change he he can't be the cocky young man that he starts out at 19, um, he, he has to learn about responsibility. And those are, I think, age-old themes, but it's very much of a moment where British industry and culture are on the cusp of really changing. And I think Barstow charts that very astutely. Thank you very much. You certainly know it's a terrifying prospect when modernity is represented by Frankie Vaughan. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Tommy Steele. You're going to uh, have a word uh, with Deborah now. I mean, to me, it's a book about the 50s. It's a book that, that already feels nostalgic for an era that hasn't yet passed in this book. It's, it's the 60s hasn't happened in this book yet, has it? Oh, it's happening. It's, it's happening big time. Um, I, and I think um, there's a lot of um, anger in this book about the repression of um, sexual morality and convention. I mean, the disaster of the relationship is because both Ingrid and um, Vic are completely sexually naive. They've not been told. It's embarrassing to go to the chemists to buy a condom because the chemist might know you. Um, uh, um, the only way of dealing with um, um, an unwanted pregnancy is to down a bottle of gin and have a hot bath. And um, I think this is a dark memory of how of the bad old days. But this, it's a book of its time. So women are dealt with as uh, in this book. Women are either wallflowers or battle axes, aren't they? There's nothing in between for women in this book. I don't think you can say that. I think I the women have... characters in this. Well, I would disagree. <laughs> Thank you. Excellent, Deborah. <laughs> um, you tell it. I would s say that you cannot argue that the women in these, in this novel, are cardboard cutouts. Um, Ingrid is, although she's um, in many ways a not very likable character, she's a very real and recognisable person. Her mother, who is appalling, is, is a monster, but she's again a very recognisable um, character. And there are lots of very strong women. Vic's mum is a very assertive woman. And Vic's sister, his relationship with Chris. Chris, um, his sister, is the wisest, sanest voice in the novel, she actually is the character that he respects above all. She's certainly not a wallflower. Absolutely or a not a wallflower. She's married. From our perspective, from our perspective in 2004, can you read it as anything other now than social history rather than literature? Oh, I think so. I mean, I remember when I first read this novel when I was about 14 or 15. Um, just two, I, or you, two or three years ago. Then. Uh, thank you. Thank um, you. Okay. Yeah, I just, um, um, I, I, it was a huge revelation because I mean, what, one of the things that it's about is the horror and the agony of dating, about, um, you know, will she, won't she come out with me? Will she, won't she call? And, um, you know, I recognise that. And I think this was a book that made me understand for the first time that men suffered those anxieties just as much as women, which I didn't, honestly didn't know. And that men, women are to men an alien species. Um, Thanks. Thanks very much.
Mariella, <laughs> uh, it's a very nice moment to move on. <laughs> Mariella. Let's find out. Jonathan. Thanks very much, Deborah. Your next witness. Um, Jonathan, I wondered, first of all, what is it about this book that you love? It's a time capsule. You know, the, one of the greatest gifts in the sack of literature <clears throat> must be the, being able to understand what it was like to live at a certain time. And here we have a, an epoch described where there's a big difference between a man who smokes woodbine and a man who smokes players. It's a big difference about whether you call your mother Mimam, mother, or your mother. It, it's a time where there's mass employment, where people get to know each other on the bus, where you can't have a, a car, you can't have a, a house. It's that what really appeals to me. It's that close observation, because it's growing from the roots of our culture, this novel. It's a humus of generations which has been explored. It, if I take a horticultural example, I find a clockwork orange is like some kind of um, hothouse concoction, like an orchid, tortured, really. And to read it, it'll tell you about the fingers of the horticulturalist, but it won't tell you about the soil or the air. And what we have here with the kind of loving is like a patch of dog daisies, I would say. One kind of colony amongst many others. So we have John Brain, we have Silito, we have Delaney, Barstow, all of them growing up from the same soil. I was really struck by the language in this book, and I think that at the time that Barstow was writing, it was quite radical to include serious working-class idioms in, in a novel, in what was supposed to be a serious novel, you know, things like, um, he walks into a wall of attar of sweat and eau de canif, or I get on with my chow and let her have a chanter, it does her good to bind a bit. I mean, that's a fantastic language, isn't it? Aye, lad, and now what it is to addle cool. I mean, to use the word addle to, to get coal. Yes, I just wonder, the readers of the time, who was the more interesting and strange and exotic-seeming character, whether it was Alex or whether it was Vic, because the, 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 the person, the kind of person that Vic was, had never been given a voice before. So he was probably more exotic. And, uh, the, yes, they will say the vitamins in the language, possibly, of a clockwork oranger are good. But, again, for me, they're artificially given. They're, like, in a capsule form, you know, Watch out, droogs, or verily I will gotcha, vacha, varacha. You know, it's a sort of a strange thing, whereas the, the kind of loving is using the language as a bone structure. It's not something grafted on. So that really appeals to me. You're obviously touched by the, the evocation of that time. Is it an age that you miss, that you've got nostalgia for it? You're obviously not of that age, but I mean, <laughs> is it something that you wish in a curious way had survived longer. Are you, do you feel about it in that way? It's a modern book. But I, I, there's no, two, there's a... two things there. I, I tell you one thing that I do miss, and in as much as this book is, is far more prescient than The Clockwork Orange, I miss the destruction of, of mass employment and where people are allowed the dignity of a job. Of course, you know, with Margaret Thatcher coming along, the axe really went to these communities, destroyed. No, laid low so that the common values and, and the, the language has just been destroyed. So I miss that aspect. But saying it's a period piece, well, I mean, how can a work of art be other than written at a certain point of time? I mean, you're not going to say, uh, oh, I like Thomas Hardy, but I wish he hadn't written about milkmaids, or <laughs> that Dickens is great, but I hate the contemporary detail of London. <laughs> no, no, it's the universal in the particular. You know, everything has to be a moment. Just because it was written in the past doesn't mean any more, doesn't mean that it belongs in the past any more than Hardy or Dickens. Of course. Kevin? Look, it's a nice book, it's a tender book, but it, in the end it's a book you pick up in the doctor's surgery, and when you're called for, you put the book down, you forget you're reading it. It's not a book that, that's going to change your life. It's not going to book that makes you think about themes or issues, is it? I don't Which doesn't think, mean to say it's not a bad book. I don't think you can call it nice, because the key aspect of it is anger. Vic says, now I know what it would be like to, for a man to murder his wife. And that's at the core of it. It's an understanding of anger. Your clockwork orange is like viewing it from a distance, designer violence, whatever you like. A kind of loving is, is being inside the time bomb, knowing, hearing it ticking, and seeing, God... The, the violence of relationships, of abusive relationships, this is how it happens. But Vic, I mean, Vic's such a painful character. You just want to get in the book and shake him and say, get on with it, make your mind up, do something with your life. Say yes, say no, just do it quickly. It takes a long time for nothing to happen, doesn't it? He's 18 you do, years old. You do feel like shaking him, and yeah. that's how human beings work. We vacillate, we procrastinate, we're like a river, we meander to our destination. If you want to excavate the stream and make its branches straight into a channel, Clockwork Orange will do that for you. It won't look in depth at why people are why they are. 
Whereas this book really gives you a sense of what it's like to be young, to be frustrated, to, to, to not know where you're going. Well, that brings us to the end of the case for A Kind of Loving. Will the tender ballad of Vic and the non-demanding Ingrid uh, woo our audience off to the library shelves? Or will this tale, as I suppose it is, of a shotgun marriage not trigger their literary desire? We shall see. Time now to consider the second of our books from the 60s, Anthony Burgess's A Clockwork Orange. Also a coming-of-age story of sorts, set in a future not too distant from Burgess's time, and some would say very familiar to us. After a spree of ultra-violence, Alex, the delinquent teenager, is apprehended and he's subjected to a brutal regime of reconditioning which leaves him physically sick at the very thought of violence. Kevin Day has two witnesses, of course, to help him make the case for A Clockwork Orange. They're Blake Morrison, journalist and writer, literary critic, librettist and poet, who's still found time to write the introduction to the latest Penguin edition of A Clockwork Orange. And Kevin's other witness is Nicky Singer, whose first novel for young people, Feather Boy, was recently dramatised and filmed for the BBC. So, Kevin, your first witness. Well, Jim, let's vide what my droogs will gather eat tonight, oh, my brothers. Ah, you champion this horror show rabbit. The language really does stick with you, Nicky, doesn't it? Yeah, it absolutely does. Um, he developed this incredible language based on about two or three hundred words primarily of a Russian Slavic origin, although he does some little cheeky-wicky baby language as well. And when you first open the book, you think, oh, my word, am I really going to be able to hack this? But he really eases you into the language. He will write a whole paragraph about Deng, and at the end he'll say, well, money isn't everything, is it? And um, it even works with the weather. I'm going to give you a little comparison here. This is Stan Barstow's very nice book. He says, outside it's sharp and clear, real clean winter weather. Nothing wrong with this sentence. Any writer would be glad to write such a sentence. This is page one of um, Clockwork Orange, also on the weather. And Alex is thinking about what he's going to do with his evening. A flip, dark, chill winter bastard, though dry. And I think you hear immediately in those use of words a little frisson. And it's not the word bastard. Anyone can use the word bastard. It's actually the word flip. What does that word flip mm. really mean? A toss or a flip side, the dark side. So he gets, he draws you in. Let's talk about Alex, because it, it's a brave novelist who chooses for his protagonist a very intelligent 15-year-old boy who happens to choose, for fun, murder and ultraviolence. But he pulls it off, doesn't he? He absolutely pulls it off, and I, I think this is, this is the triumph of the novel. I mean, I'm a liberal, middle-class feminist mother of three. I me mean, this guy, <laughs> this guy should be an anathema to me. Yeah. This guy rapes, he pillages, he murders. He's extremely unpleasant, but also he's very endearing. He's very vulnerable. He's extremely funny. You get drawn in, and partly it's the way in which Burgess does the narrating. Partly it's, oh, my brothers, the way um, Alex himself makes you into one of his droogs. But partly, again, it is the language. Mm. It, it, in the end, though, take the violence away. But I know because people are kind of wrapped up in the violence because they haven't read the book. They know about the book from the film or from the fuss about the film or from Daily Mail editorials. What makes the book such a good read? Because it is a fantastic cracking read in the end, isn't it? It's a cracking read. It's a mad, bad, dangerous to know mm. book. It's certainly not an orchid. It's more like one of those undergrowth lords and ladies. It's a brilliant spine of poisonous red berries. It's mm. a huge book because it deals with um, big subjects. It deals with morality. Mm. It deals with the state versus Choice. the individual. It's yeah. not some homespun tale of tale from the north and it, it also does what I think a good book really should do which is it takes you to some place you've never been before and in this case inside the head of you know a vicious Malachik who happens to have certain endearing features. Mm. They'll be discussing books and gardeners question time next <laughs> if we carry on like this. Uh, Mariella. The final chapter is supposed to denote some kind of great change in Alex mm. but really all he does is grow up. He suddenly gets bored, he's hanging out with his mates, his droogs, and suddenly he's bored, he can't understand why he's bored. Then he goes to a cafe, he has a, a milky tea with a, an old droog who's now married and happy, and he thinks, oh, I think maybe I ought to change. And that's it. I mean, it's a bit of a sort of splutter of a book, really, isn't it? It's this kind of raging rampage, and then nothing. Burgess's point is, it's better to be free to choose to be evil than to be forced to be good. But inside that morality, I think there's a much bigger morality being explored and a, and, and a much greyer morality. Part of that morality is, if I empathise with this hero, what does that say about me? And for me, a good book is something that doesn't necessarily answer the questions, but asks the questions, asks the question of me. So he asks that question. But also, there's something which I think is extraordinary about the morality of the book, which goes into Burgess's own life, which is that when he, his wife was um, pregnant with their first child, she was beaten up 
by, not by a gang of droogs, but by four ex, as it happens, um, US GIs, and she lost the baby. Now, you might think, and I might think as a writer, what am I going to do with that information? Well, Burgess couldn't do anything for that information for about 10 years. When he did, what he did is he didn't write a book from the perspective of the victim. He wrote a book from the perspective perspective of the perpetrator. No, and you know what? That really bothers me as well, because the victim was his wife, and you'd think he would have cared more about her than to write a book which, described by Blake, is a catharsis for Burgess and an act of charity to his wife's assailants. I think what you're suggesting is that, you know, it borders somehow on pornography, mm. but I think things only border on pornography when either they degrade or when there is no context, when there is no... and, and when you don't care about anybody. And I'm sorry you don't care. Um, we have to disagree about that. I do care about him. I want to know what's going to happen. And I want to turn the pages. I think if you didn't care, you would simply shut the book. OK, we'll leave it there. Kevin, your next witness. <clears throat> In the book, uh, one of the central characters, I think, is the prison chaplain, who has a great dilemma about whether it's right to force good onto people to stop them misbehaving. Is the way that society deals with deviance the central point? point of the book? I, I think it's the big point. Um, I mean, bigger beyond it is it's there in the title, Clockwork Orange. Do, do you want a human being to be like a piece of clockwork wound up, running in a straight line, well behaved, or do you want a human being to be an orange, alive, growing? And, you know, that's the big point about Alex, which seems to be missed here. He grows, he changes, he, he becomes uh, 18 or and, and he reaches the age of maturity and he lets it all go. Um, he's, he, he's a bad boy, who becomes capable of being a good man. And, and that, that's what it's about. Now, you can imagine very easily a society that says, look, we can, we can crack juvenile culture. We've got a way through aversion therapy and B.F. Skinner experiments with rats transferred to humans and Pavlov responses. We, we can find a way to condition people to be good. Um, but Burgess says, no, no, that, that, that's no good. We, people have to discover that thing in themselves. Individuals have to learn how to be good. We can't impose that as a society, and, and that's what it's about. Classical music is very important to Alex, the character, but it's, it's not a civilising influence. It's the only book I think I've ever read where, where high art it doesn't civilise. Does that reflect Burgess's view of, of high art? Yeah, well, I think it does. I mean, you've got to remember that, I suppose, we weren't back many years after the Second World War when he wrote it, and what everybody was conscious of at the time was that, you know, those Nazi guards in... Auschwitz and so on, were playing Beethoven and Bach and so on. Um, and so the idea of art music being civilising, you know, Burgess was very sceptical about that idea. Um, I think it's also quite funny that, it, he, you know, Alex's favourite bit of music is Beethoven. I mean, if it had been Elvis or um, Billy Fury or something sort of locked into its time, late 50s, early 60s, the book would have dated. And what's great about the book is it hasn't dated at all. I mean, we, we feel the, the stuff it's dealing with whether it's juvenile crime or, or, or violence or, or drugs or whatever, you know, th this is the world we inhabit now. And it is essentially an optimistic ending, isn't it? I know the American edition left out that last chapter, but it is optimistic because there is the hint of change and redemption that comes from him and not from outside, isn't it? Yeah, um, the structure of the book is a beautifully simple structure. You know, you've got uh, 21 chapters, part one, seven chapters about Alex being bad, Part two, seven chapters about Alex being cured of being bad by state repression and torture. Part three, he goes back, he's a free man. He nearly resumes a world of violence. And then chapter 21, which is the one that got left out of the film and the American edition of the book, he reaches the age of maturity. He leaves it all behind. He grows up. Um, he wants a baby. He wants a wife. He's, he sees women as, as women rather than sexual objects. Um, so, so, yeah, it's, it's a huge change and redemption in the last chapter. Perfect summing up. Mariella, your witness. You said yourself in the introduction to the book, there's no denying that the book is most alive when its hero behaves wickedly, not when he's paying for his crimes. So basically, you love the first seven chapters because you've got a vicarious thrill, and after that, it's boring. No, look, I'm, I'm sorry, Mariella, but it, it, it is possible for people to enjoy works of art that have bad people in them. Yes, I no. absolutely agree. Shakespearean I love tragedy, many, you know, there are... There many are, works of art that know, have bad people will be, in let them. Respond I'm not asking for good all. people, I'm asking for some sort of motion, yeah. some sort of journey to take place in the book, apart from a journey from one 
beating up spot to another. Right, well, Blake. Uh, it, it, uh, I'm, I am sorry that Alex is not a goody goody, but uh, he well, isn't. If, um, I have and, to disagree <laughs> every time you say that. No, <laughs> okay. I've made it very clear. I, it's not, I'm not taking against Alex because he's not a goody goody. I would like to see some rite of passage in the book. He could go from good to bad for all I care. I'd just like to see him do something. But there is a rite of passage. He grows up. I, I'm, I'm sorry it's so simple, but he grows up. He decides. He reaches a certain age. He's kind of bored of hanging around with his mates. He starts looking in magazines and seeing babies and thinking, hmm, I'd quite like to be do a dad and have a, a child look at me. Blake, do you think that's what happens? That uh, Alex's experience, in other words, is more common than we might like to think, given the nature of the violence he's been engaged in? Yeah, I, do, I don't think we see many geriatrics going out rampaging and beating people up. It's something that happens to young men. And Burgess says, OK, it's very regrettable. Don't worry but about young it, men, grow out of it. But, yeah, and that's the point of the book. That's young it. men grow up. But what? But what the alternative? Right. But he's writing at a time when people are, and they still are, considering very draconian methods of dealing with juvenile crime. And young men lock them up for life. We've reached, what, what about we've reached the happy point where you two disagree profoundly <laughs> and have made the basis of your disagreement clear. Thanks very much. It concludes the case for a Clockwork Orange, a book which clearly still has the power to move. Will the audience want the full Technicolor experience of being in Alex's gang of droogs? Well, we'll find out shortly. Time now for our advocates to make their final pleas for the audience's vote. And we'll hear first from Kevin. Even though this book is partly written in a made-up slang, I truly believe that it is an essential, an essential read for anyone with an interest in the literature of the English language. A short novel about a callous and violent teenager contains images, ideas, language, humour, politics, entertainment and debate that will stay with you long after you've closed the book with the single word, blimey. Mariella. We're looking for a book that sums up the 60s, and a kind of loving is that book. It's suffused with the themes of its time, from forbidden desire to the breakdown of community. It looks forward to a confusing future, and it encapsulates the era it's written in. This is a book about human beings struggling to come to terms with this newfound choice that they're given, and not knowing what to do in terms of morality, in terms of their exchanges with each other. It's not about a bunch of droogs on a violent, drug fueled rampage. This is a proper, serious, beautiful book, uh, despite the cover. Mariella, thank you very much. So the cases are before you. That's the basis on which you have to decide. As Alex would say, what's it going to be then, eh? Vic or Alex, lads or droogs? Bints or Davochkas, I suppose you could say. <laughs> Let's get on with the vote anyway. <laughs> Blue cards if you want to vote for A Clockwork Orange. Yellow cards if you're going to vote for Stan Barstow's A Kind of Loving. Vote now. I'm <laughs> just about even there, actually. I might go on a drug fuel <laughs> rampage yes, this afternoon. I can't remember which it's hot milk to drink. Anyone there? got it's any hot milk real. on them? <laughs> <laughs> Well, after a passionate debate, the case is made with real fervour. I can tell you that Burgess has won. The audience has decided that on the basis of what it's heard, it would rather read A Clockwork Orange than A Kind of Loving. As always, they're both worth reading. Until next time on Battle of the Books, goodbye. I'd read A Clockwork Orange. And that's the most instantly memorable and most sensational of the two books. But I think after hearing uh, more about it from the witnesses, I was utterly converted. And I think a kind of loving is more heart, whereas uh, Clockwork Orange is more head. I voted for the Clockwork Orange because the way it was described today, it seemed to be from a teenager's point of view rather than the adults. And it showed that towards the end he changed because he wanted to and not because he was forced to. No, I like the story, I don't know that. I voted for A Kind of Loving. Um, to be honest, I hadn't read either book, but Mariella's argument was so passionate, it convinced me that it's worth reading, especially if I want to get an insight into 1960s life. Mm -hmm.